Good morning, this is Matthias Engelman at Carolina Raptor Center and today I want to talk to you a little bit about radiographs or x-rays as some of you might say. Um, actually radiographs is the better term when you're talking to a professional in the wildlife or the medicine field you know, in general. So I've got here a, a display of one of our current kit patients. So why are we taking radiographs of birds? Um, so a lot of times they will give us insights into what's going on, things that we can't feel or see when we do a physical exam on a patient. Um, so for instance, we might be able to see the exterior of the wings and the body, but we can't see inside, obviously, and see what's going on. And sometimes there are things that are easily missed um, on a physical exam, and then you find out on a radiograph later on. For instance, in this case, if you compare the two wings, Notice how this is a normal ulna right here, and here is a fracture fairly close to the wrist. That you could almost miss if you did a very quick exam because it's so close to the joint and there's not much movement there. Um, so sometimes they can really help you figure out what's going on with your patient. Um, so let me talk about anatomy in general while we have this one out. It's a radiograph up. So here's a typical hawk. This happens to be a red-shouldered hawk. Um, and the way we get this radiograph is we anesthetize the bird. You notice here the cone is visible. So this bird is under gas anesthesia at that moment. It takes a f literally two to three minutes to induce them. Then they're asleep and then you can position them the way you want them because obviously these are wild animals. They're not going to stay there, not going to lay there in the position you want them to uh, for you to get an x-ray or radiograph. Um, they're gonna move, which means your picture would be blurry, so that's not going to work. So here he is asleep, um, nice and stretched out, and you can notice he's got a very long neck. Usually when they're awake, that neck is kind of curved into an S shape. Um, we try to position them very carefully so they're symmetrical, so the keel bone is exactly on top, superimposed to the spine, and so we can compare side to side. If they're rotated slightly, then everything is off kilter and you can't quite tell what within the body is, is normal or not. But anyway, so we've got here, you see the skull and the, the uh, jaw bones up here in the beak. Uh, the eyes, I'll show you a better radiograph later on that talks about eyes. Obviously the long neck and we're in the shoulder region. Matthias, do raptors always have such a long neck? Um, they do, yes, as far as I know, our, our native species anyway always have a long neck like this. It's not usually visible because when they're normally perched or sitting or standing or even flying, a lot of times it would not be stretched out like this. It would be folded into an S-shaped curve, so it looks a lot shorter. But they all have a very long and very flexible neck that allows them to move the head uh, when everything else is you know very still. It also allows them... It makes up for the fact that they can't move their eyes as much in their skull. They can move the entire head. And you probably all heard the stories about hawks and owls looking straight back. So yes, they can turn their head 180 degrees, look straight back, and even beyond that, they can usually go 270 degrees. So starting out from the front, they can go three quarters of the way in each direction. Um, so the long neck is very important for that purpose as well. Um, here we have the shoulder region, so here's where the wings attach to the, the shoulder. Um, there's the humerus, just like in us, they have a humerus, nice S-shaped curve. They have a radius and ulna. In this case, the, the radius is the smaller of the two, the ulna is the larger. That's different from our arm structure. In our case, the ulna would be the smaller of the two. And here's all that's left of their hand, or the equivalent of the hand. Uh, just a couple of fingers, they've lost most of the fingers, Lost, lost most of the bones, and there's just a few bones left, and these are very important because the 10 outer primaries are attached to this section of bone right here, what we call the metacarpals. So all 10 outer primaries, which are very important for flight, are attached to that short section of bone. And here you can see actually the secondaries, which come off the ulna right here. If we go back to the body, um, there are two two sets of bones that connect the wing to the body. They're called coracoid and clavicle. Clavicle, everybody knows, that's the wishbones that you break when you dissect a chicken, let's say, during dinner. Um, but these are very important, especially the coracoid. It's a very large, thick bone. It's kind of small up here, but it widens out into a fan shape. Sorry, I keep touching the image. <laughs> I'm not supposed to do that. 
Anyway, internal anatomy is a little more tricky and I'm not the expert. Dr. Scott is the one who would know more about this, but you can see the heart right here in the center and here the lobes of the liver right here. The lungs, you can't quite tell. They're kind of wedged into the sides and they're really squished into place. Um, everything else is air sacs and then there are the intestines, stomach and intestines going all the way down to the very end. Um, they have a nice spinal column, of course, and there's a pelvis. Let me get it. Enlarge this a little bit. There's the pelvis, so here's the femur connected to the hip on each side. Um, femur, just like in us. Now, their legs are very long. Let me scroll this up. Hopefully, I won't mess this up too much. Oh. The legs are very long, which again is most noticeable when they're asleep. When they're perched, you might not see them because the legs can fold up nicely, but they have a femur, tibia tarsus, which is the equivalent of our shin bone, basically. Uh, and then you see a tiny sliver of a bone as well. That's part of that arrangement. And then down here is part of the, what we call a tarsal metatarsus. And also that would be part of the foot. In them, it's an extension of the leg. So they're standing on their tippy toes, really. Um, that's why they have such long legs, those leg, those Bones have been extended over time. And you can also notice here, tail feathers, 12 tail feathers. So that's the basic anatomy. Matthias, what kind of bird is that that we're... This is a red-shouldered hawk. Yes, this is one of our current cases, 23185, who's still with us. Um, that wing is actually, that fracture is just about healed now. He's waiting for some feathers to grow in, and then hopefully he'll be ready to go. So that's basic anatomy. Um, let's see, let me talk about uh, a couple different cases. Hang on, let me get rid of these so we don't have too much stuff in So the what way. program is this that you're oh, using? Oh, so this is RaptorMed. This is how we keep track of all of our patients in rehab as well as on the resident bird care side. Developed by Dr. Scott here, right here on site. Specifically so we can track and manage cases um, here at the center, but also it's now being used worldwide to track fish at aquariums and all kinds of animals all over the place. It's really cool because it's geared towards animals and it can be adapted and changed to, to make use of the features it has. I have another question. Do they have patellas? They do actually, yes. And I'll have a radiograph here in a minute. Let's see. Let's start out with let me go to that one right now, in fact, while we're talking about it. So a you saw the typical view that we had of av almost every bird. When we get a radiograph, we normally do that one view that shows the bird laying down on its back. Sometimes that's not enough. It doesn't tell us what we need to know. So here's a good example of why. So here's a barred owl uh, that was here back uh, in 2000. Uh, no, I'm sorry, he is still with us. I'm sorry. <laughs> He's still with us. And here's his intake radiograph. And if you go, let me see if I can zoom without losing too much here. Notice there's a problem right here, right? His femur is broken. So that's the normal view, what we call VD or ventrodorsal or dorsoventral, you could say. It tells you that the bone is broken, but it doesn't give enough detail. So we do another view of the same bird. It's another reason why. He wouldn't do this on his own. We call this the running man posture. <laughs> so we lay the bird on his side. He's still asleep, still in the cone. And if I zoom in, you can see a little better. This tells you more about what exactly is broken. So right here's the femur. There's the good side. One nice long bone. Here's the, the broken one. You can tell two pieces. And this one actually uh, has been repaired since, since this was taken. But they noticed the patella right there on each mm -hmm. leg. How do these birds get injured? So the number one known cause of injury is getting hit by cars. And that has to do with habitat loss and the fact that their habitat is now broken up into many, many different sections because we have developed areas. You know, we have roads and, car and, uh, and housing developments that break up their ranges, their home ranges into smaller and smaller pieces. They don't pay attention to cars and they fly across the path of a car and, and just don't, don't even care that something's coming. They don't realize that it's a threat to, to them. So unfortunately, that's the number one cause that we know of. Um, there are other causes. 
uh, they may fly into any number of structures that we've built over time, whether it's windows, fences, power lines, you name it. it some of those just don't look like a normal structure. They're not something that they're used to seeing and they don't pay attention. So most of the time it's caused by people, some... I would say 95% of what we see is caused by people and the structures we've built in, in their habitat, which happens to be our habitat as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so anyway, so and sometimes, sometimes we'll need a different view. And I guess this is where anesthesia comes in really handy because the bird will definitely not just lay there and hold still long enough to do this. So this bird is still with us. He's only been here a couple days and he had surgery several days after this was taken. I don't think we have a radiograph after the fact. So Dr. Scott will do these surgeries almost, I could say blind by feel because he doesn't have a way to radiograph as he's doing the surgeries. So we'll take one after the fact at some point to follow up on the progress of this case. So a lot of the times they are um, surgically repaired Depends on the type of injury it is. Some of them can only be repaired surgically, like a humerus fracture, for instance, the upper arm bone equivalent. Uh, they always have to be repaired that way. Some of them, like the ulna, the first case we saw, the red-shouldered hawk, do not need surgery in many cases, <clears throat> because in that case, you have the radius ulna running parallel. If only one's broken, the other one will act as a natural splint, and then they just require a bandage to hold the wing immobilized for as long as they get physical therapy on a regular basis two to three times a week while they're anesthetized you can stretch the wing to make sure nothing gets stiff and put the bandage back on they'll heal on their own without surgery so that's always the preferred treatment because surgery is always invasive you cause a little bit more damage unfortunately because you have to put those pins in there all right let's see pull up another case here let's see who do we have how about this guy? Oh yeah, so here's a bird who did not heal nearly as quickly as we thought it would. Um, and I'll show you a couple different pictures. So he came in with this injury, radius ulna. So that's the problem here. This is where surgery is required because when both of these bones are broken, there's nothing to, to stabilize the situation. So Dr. Scott did surgery First on one and then on the second bone. Oh, come on. Doesn't want to go. Hold on. I'll get there eventually. Um, you put a stainless steel pin into the radius and you can really almost not see the bone because the pin is so bright now. So anything that's metal shows up very bright. That's what we're seeing here. The pin, which is bent over, so only this part right here is actually in the bone. But notice the ulna is still out of place, of course. So that first surgery um, just immobilized the radius. We did a second surgery to utilize a larger pin that goes into the ulna. And now you notice the two pieces of ulna are now realigned in the right place. And these pins will stay in for several weeks until those bones have healed, or usually several weeks. So what happened in this case was well, pretty strange. We don't see it very often, but notice how the radius healed very quickly, and within a couple of weeks, this pin was already removed, but there was all this fuzzy growth around the bones, on both bones, the radius and the ulna. So here it is in August. This was um, a month after surgery. And the pins, the, the fractures were pretty stable, so the pins could come out, but there was still this strange growth so normally when a bone heals, you'll see a little bit of a bubble, what we call a callus. There's bone forming that bridges the gap between the two broken pieces. Um, but you notice here, there's actually a, a real gap almost still visible. So there's lots of bone growing and lots of bone growing in places where you wouldn't expect it. There were no fractures anywhere near here. So this may have been, may have been a bone infection, what we call osteomyelitis. Um, it finally did get better over time, and the bones did heal. Um, but here he is, several months later, you can still see there is some unusual features to both of these bones. There's still a gap evident, but it was very strong, now that the, the connection was very strong. So this bird was released. So osteomyelitis is a bone infection? Bone infection, yes. Did he have to take antibiotics for that? He did, yes. He was an antibiotic, typically with any 
fracture of a bone, they would always be on antibiotics for at least two to three weeks. You know, just like people, if you go and have surgery, yeah. you'll have to take antibiotics. Yeah, and especially think about in these cases, the way they're injured, you know, they don't usually, they're not usually found on the first day. So they might wander around with a broken wing with bones poking out for two or three days before they're weak enough to be captured. Well, when those bones are poking out, anytime the skin is broken, of course, bacteria can get into the wound and into the bones and an infection will start almost immediately. All right, let's switch gears. Let's Here's talk. a question. After major surgeries, do they seem to realize that they need to take it easy or do they immediately try to, <laughs> to do no, what they would they normally don't. do? I mean, you know, every bird acts differently. Um, I mean, sometimes they are weak because of underlying secondary issues, like they're very emaciated, dehydrated, so they're not nearly as active for a few days. But as soon as they start feeling better, because we give them fluids and food and antibiotics and pain medications, they start feeling better and they're going to get rambunctious. So we have to physically come hold them in smaller cages. We don't want them to get too much exercise at first, because if they have broken bones, those bones have to be somewhat stable. Even if they're surgically repaired, we don't want them to start flying right away. I mean, we want them to have limited exercise, so they're not just sitting there and getting weaker and atrophying all those muscles, but we want them to be somewhat calm. And no, the answer is they don't typically cooperate. We have to make sure they're in a small enough cage where they can't injure themselves further and where the healing can take place. And then they gradually go to a larger and larger cages until they end up in a flight cage where they can mm -hmm. really exercise. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to show you, let's see, what do we have here? Oh yeah, so one of the things we might do sometimes when they're in very serious, in very serious cases, we actually give them fluids. So here's obviously a serious case. Look at this, a broken humerus. Um, this bird had to have intraosseous fluids. So here you see a metal pin inserted into a bone. So this will be like you and I having an IV catheter in. We don't do IV catheters very often. Their veins are pretty fragile and they can blow very easily and then you can't use them for several days because you have a large hematoma there. But an alternative is to put a needle into, the, into certain bones. The ulna is one of those. It's connected directly to the bloodstream so you can give them IV fluids basically except it's called IO or intraosseous. And that catheter will stay in place for a couple of days and then comes out. All right, let me move on. I have some other cool cases. I have a question. How do you get them back into our exam rooms to check them out once they're in a flight cage? Right, so you have to capture them very carefully. So we have large nets. They're kind of like butterfly nets, but they're modified to the where well, they don't have netting, but they have a bag basically a uh, cloth or a, you could think of it as a, a pillowcase, maybe a large pillowcase. And the rim of the net is padded so we don't injure them accidentally when we try to capture them. So we literally go in the flight cage, try to catch them on a perch or try to catch them while they're in mid-flight, carefully contain them, and then either examine them there on site in the cage or if we have to bring them in for a radiograph or a taking blood or something, we'll bring them to the exam table here. Uh, let me find another case real quick. Hang on, there's a bunch of pictures open. Um, Do we typically take um, radiographs of all of our patients that come in through the hospital? Uh, not necessarily all of them, um, but most of them. Um, sometimes it'll help us find problems. You know, if we can't find anything wrong with them, that's suspicious. How was this bird able to be captured if there's nothing wrong with it? So sometimes that's the best way to find an injury, through a radiograph. Um, but we also do it when we have surgical cases for follow-up. Um, so here is one I was going to, I promised you a radiograph of a skull, and here's a good one. So this is a great horned owl. This is a great owl. horned owl, and let's see if I can focus this. I wanted to show you this because I'm sure you've <laughs> talked about the size of the eyes in an owl. So this is the skull of a great horned owl. The tip of the beak is missing, but notice how huge these eyes are. The two globes, they're meeting in the back here. Uh, they take up literally half the two thirds of the skull. And notice how long those eyes are. 
and how wide. So there's lots of space here for rods and cones. So they definitely light. don't look like just like a marble or just a nope. sphere. They are these, very different you shape. You couldn't play marble very, <laughs> with these very well. Yeah, they're, they're intentionally that large and that deep so they collect more light, which is important when you're hunting during hours when there's little daylight available. And in fact, you can almost see this area that's a little brighter. There are the bones that help support the shape. It's most noticeable on the outside here. They don't show up as bright as these other bones, but there's a little ring of bones that forms around this eye to help keep it that tubular shape. Wow. Um, I was going to show you, let's see if I can find them real quick. We occasionally get dislocations. In fact, we have one right now in rehab. And dislocations are very painful to these birds, just like I imagine they would be to us. So if you notice this bird, you notice the two elbows. Here's a normal elbow, humerus, radius, ulna. And here's a not so normal. Look how both the radius, ulna are overlapping, basically. So not even close to where they are. So we were able to get this back into the right place under anesthesia. And it was uh, a relatively recent injury. The fresher these are, the better the chances of re repairing these. So um, here he is, um, same, same day, in fact, within a few minutes later, everything's back in place. Um, just by man manipulating the bones, it popped back into place. And now we, we bandaged this bird for several weeks. Again, gave it physical therapy every couple of days under anesthesia so it can't struggle and can't accidentally pop these back out. And this bird is actually in a flight cage right now. So he came in in January, late January. Here he's in February. We took a follow-up radiograph. Still everything's in place. And he's now in a flight cage flying 40 to 40, 50 feet or so. And the, the wings are still functional. So I think he's turned a corner and this bird should be released. So that was a good outcome for something that's sometimes not very happy when we see them, especially when they're older. The longer they stay out of place, the worse the prognosis. That's so cool. It's so neat to have a success story. Yeah, it is. Uh, let me see. I have one other crazy bird here. Well, crazy. It's my time for him. Let me find him. Here he is. So sometimes we find surprises when we get a radiograph. So this, so this is a red-tailed red -tailed hawk. hawk. He was here back in 2017. And when we took his radiograph, we found something somewhat unusual. Let's see if I can zoom in a little bit. All right, so he looks mostly normal with one exception. There's something strange going on right here. This happened to be in the springtime and this happened to be a large red-tailed hawk. Mm -hmm. We were guessing it's a female. That pretty much confirms it. So this is an egg. And this is almost fully developed. In fact, this bird laid this egg within a day or two afterwards. It wasn't fully formed and it wasn't, wasn't fertilized. But you never know what you're going to find when you take a radiograph. <laughs> and notice how huge this egg is. How long do they carry an egg inside them like that? Wow. You know, I don't know if I know the answer to that. I don't know the answer either. <laughs> yeah, so they have over they have uh, two ovaries. I want to say two ovaries. No, I think they have one ovary. Usually one is atrophied. They only have mm -hmm. one developed ovary. So there'll be a little cluster of eggs somewhere right in there where the arrow is right now. And they will develop one at a time into something larger uh, and eventually form a shell around it. But how long it takes from that tiny little cluster to that size, I do not know. Good question. Um, let's see. Do I have any other cases? Uh, that might have been all the cases I had pulled up. Do you have any other questions that you know mm, of? Not really, no. no. Well, this was so cool. Thank you so okay. much, Matthias. You're welcome. Thanks, and stay safe. Bye. Bye.